I've been riding the Marin Wolf Ridge, which is one of two bikes released recently to use the suspension system from a company called Nailed. What makes this suspension system unique is that it uses a telescopic slider, which is basically a round tube that slides into the swing arm via a motorbike fork seal and a pair of bushings. So there's no torsional rigidity in that telescopic slider. It's not like a Cannondale Lefty, which is square on the inside to keep it, to keep it stiff. So it would just rotate if it wasn't for the two short links, which also connect it to the mainframe. Between them, they define how the rear axle moves through its travel. So the idea behind this is that it will pedal really efficiently without need of excessive damping and without need of a lockout, whilst also remaining active over bumps. Marin say that this is kind of a quiver killer because it pedals so well uphill and descends so well downhill that you no longer need multiple bikes. They say it will do everything really well. So Marin say that this bike has high levels of something called anti-squat all the way through the travel. Basically anti-squat is the effect of the chain tension to resist pedal bob. So basically the bike is configured in such a way that the axle moves away from the bottom bracket as it moves through the travel. But as you're pedaling, the chain is under tension and so that resists that bob to keep the suspension from bobbing too much when you're pedaling hard. So that's why bikes with more anti-squat tend to pedal more efficiently. However, there is a downside to this. As the suspension compresses, the rear wheel pulls on the chain, which can move the chain ring back and cause the front crank arm to be lifted up. And this is called pedal kickback. And because the Marin has high levels of anti-squat all the way through the stroke, it means that you're contributing towards that pedal kickback all the way through the travel. As a result, the total pedal kickback numbers on this bike are really quite high. So that's the theory, but most of the time I didn't actually find this to be a problem at all. That's because when your wheels are spinning, the cassette can actually just move around and that can allow the, the chain enough slack that you don't actually get pedal kickback whilst you're rolling at speed. So when you're hitting big rocky sections at speed, the suspension actually works really well. When you combine the big wheels with the long travel, it actually soaks up those kind of square edged hits really nicely. And at the same time, you have all that anti-squat. So when you're standing, pedaling out of the saddle, it feels really efficient. It, it's almost uncanny how little it bobs under power. So in that sense, it kind of works as advertised. But there are two big exceptions to that. The first is when your rear wheel is locked up. In that case, the cassette can no longer spin forwards to allow the chain the slack for the suspension to move. So you can feel a little bit of kickback through the front pedal when you hit a bump. And also the suspension seems to sort of choke up and spike under those circumstances. It's not very active when, especially when the rear wheel is locked up. At the same time, there's a heck of a lot of play in the back end of this bike. And as the rear wheel flexes, it actually moves the shock from side to side. And I think what could be happening is that the shock is being twisted as the back end of the bike flexes relative to the mainframe. And when that happens, the shock kind of binds up and it can no longer slide smoothly through its travel. And that could also be contributing to that kind of spiking and harshness that I've, I've been feeling through the back of the bike. It especially happens under cornering when the bike is loaded up into a corner. The, the bike can go from feeling normally really plush and, and smooth to feeling kind of harsh and spiky in those situations. Also when you're climbing seated, the suspension is really reluctant to move up and over bumps. I think because the, the tension from the chain is preventing the rear wheel from moving up and out of the way effectively. This is made far worse by the seat angle, which is super slack. Once you include the layback on that seat post, it's actually got a custom layback seat post, which gives you an effective seat angle of about 73 degrees, which I think is way too slack. And as a result, your weight is fully over the back axle. So when you hit a bump seated, your whole weight has to come up and over the bump. Whereas if you had a steeper seat angle and maybe a longer chain stay, then the, your weight is more isolated from that bump. So as the wheels move up and over the bumps, your weight stays roughly in the same place in the middle. Uh, the Marin couldn't be further from that. It, your weight is right over the rear axle and it all has to move up and over out, out of the way. So when you're riding steep terrain, you're kind of hunched over to keep the front wheel from lifting because the seat angle is so slack. So overall, it's, it's a really kind of uncomfortable and kind of awkward bike to ride up steep and technical terrain when you're seated. 
Now when you're pedaling stood up on smoother terrain, it does have that huge advantage that you have almost no pedal bob. So almost all of your energy is going straight to the back wheel. But I did find that because the reach is fairly short on this bike, it's 475 mil in the XL, that the bars were a bit close. So it's not a particularly comfortable position, I found, even when you stood up. So when you're descending, the geometry doesn't really do it any favors either. With a head angle of 66 and a half degrees and a reach of 475 in XL, those numbers may have looked, you know, pretty, pretty progressive for a 29er a few years ago. But these days in the context of bikes like the YS150 and Scott's revamped Genius, which both have head angles in the kind of 65 degree range and longer reach figures as well, the Marin actually feels a little bit kind of short and twitchy in comparison. Admittedly, the Marin is far more naturally pedal efficient than those two bikes, but it weighs about 14 kilograms, so it's not exactly light. And with those other bikes, you can always just put the lockout on if you really want to, to have a bike that doesn't bob under power. That way the suspension doesn't have to be so compromised between pedaling efficiently and absorbing bumps well. I was also a little concerned by the fact that my test bike, and I can only speak to the bike that I rode, had a kind of creaking sound when the wheel twisted from side to side, which you could feel and hear as you pedaled. The two links that connect the swing arm to the mainframe are really quite slender, and that's what introduces a lot of that flex. Uh, but the flex is okay. I don't mind a bike that flexes because it can give you more traction in the corners, but it's the play. There was noticeable kind of clunky play which I really did not like. This is perhaps even more worrying when you consider the price, which is pretty flipping high. I tested the middle of the range Wolfridge 9, which comes with an X01 Eagle, a Lyric RCT3, and a Monarch Debonair Shock. In the UK, that will retail for 5,750 pounds. There's also a Pro model, which will retail for 7,750 pounds, and a slightly cheaper model that will retail for 4,750 pounds. Even taking into account the fact that it's a full carbon frame with an innovative suspension design, the spec for that money is, is pretty poor, to be honest. It comes with pretty cheap tires, fairly cheap brakes. It's kind of middle of the road componentry for a pretty top end price. Now you may have got the impression by this point that I wasn't overly impressed with the Marin Wolf Ridge. And so as part of due diligence in testing, what we did was we got in touch with Marin told them exactly what we'd found, and they got back to us suggesting that the bike I was testing had been kind of, kind of ragged by their kind of network of dealers. Uh, it had been ridden in really kind of gritty, muddy conditions, and that may have contributed towards the, the flex and the play that I was feeling, and also the binding and the suspension. So what we did was, we got a second test bike that was fresher, which also had a lighter shock tune, which they said would also help with the kind of choking issues in the suspension system. This test bike was actually a size large as opposed to the extra large that I tested originally. And that meant that it was kind of too small for me, but it did mean that my colleagues Rob Weaver and Tom Marvin could ride that bike also, so we could get a second and a third opinion on the bike. Straight away, it was clear that this bike didn't have the side to side play in the back end that the first bike had. That was noticeable both kind of in the car park, but also when you're riding, when you're pedaling, and when you're hitting corners, it didn't have that kind of clunky feel that the first bike did. I think mostly because of that lack of play and lack of movement, but also because of the lighter shock tune, it definitely felt more predictable in the corners. I was getting less of that choking feeling that I got with the first bike. However, when hitting corners really hard, kind of tight, hard pack corners, you can still feel the back wheel kind of flexing in that sort of plane relative to the mainframe. And this is something that, that Tom and, and Rob also noticed. And it, it feels quite unpredictable and you kind of get stood up in corners because the back end is kind of fishtailing that in that slightly unpredictable way. We also found that while the suspension works kind of really well when you're plowing through rocky sections, when you're on the power, especially when you're climbing, um, the tension in the chain still is stopping the suspension reacting very nicely. So it kind of, it kind of jerks you up and over bumps, especially in seated climbing, which I think is, is mostly an artifact of that super slack uh, pedaling position. 
where your weight is right over the rear axle. But I think it's also to do with the suspension. Uh, just because you have quite high anti-squat all the way through the travel, you get an inevitable consequence of that is that it's pretty unreactive when the chain is under tension, i.e. when you're pedaling hard. So we all found that the bike did kind of lurch up and down a bit over rough technical climbs. I also had a really interesting conversation with Daryl Voss, who engineered the reactive play suspension system that this bike uses. He suggested that the issue we were having with the suspension not reacting particularly well under power could have been down to the shock tune still not being light enough, even though this was a lighter shock tune than the original we had. But actually, I think this is an inevitable consequence of how the bike is designed. So Marin say that they will be updating the shock yoke um, and how the shock attaches to the swing arm in order to isolate the shock from flex to stop it from binding under lateral loads. They've sort of hinted and I suspect that they will also be updating the hardware to reduce the amount of flex in the back end. Uh, but they're a little bit vague on that at the moment. They also say that these updates will be retrofitable to previous Marin Wolf ridges. So if you've already got one, you should be able to um, get that update fitted to your, to your bike. Despite the issues that I've described, I do think that this suspension system has potential just because it has a huge advantage in terms of pedaling efficiency. It just needs to be housed in a bike with overall much more progressive modern geometry to take advantage of what the system can offer. Because at the end of the day, it's the geometry that defines most how the bike rides.